Welcome to another section of our ICU refresher course. In this section, we will aim to build upon the earlier presentation of airway management with the help of some videos and illustrations. Before we begin, it is important to revise again some of the important considerations when you are managing a patient suspected or confirmed to have COVID-19. Firstly, whenever possible and safe to do so, intubation should ideally be done in an airborne infection isolation room or a single room. Minimize the people involved and maintain strict infection control precautions. Early intubation, good preparation and planning will help to reduce complications during the procedure and minimize exposure to the team. To reduce the need for back mask ventilations and potential dispersion of respiratory droplets or aerosols, rapid sequence intubation is recommended and good oxygenation is crucial, especially in a patient with significant hypoxic respiratory failure. The most experienced procedure should perform the intubation and also a runner is very important to help get equipment in the setting of an isolation room and it's important to be very careful during donning and especially doffing of PPE. In any critically ill patient, always call for help and make sure that you are firstly in appropriate PPE. The next step is to assess the airway, both in terms of a potentially anatomically difficult airway as well as the risk of difficulty ventilating a patient using mass ventilation. This has been covered in the earlier talk. Also important to assess is the risk of a physiologically difficult airway. This is common in critically ill patients. They may be hypotensive or in severe shock, and the team has to make a clinical judgment whether it's safe to perform the intubation. If the degree of hemodynamic instability is, is much more severe relative to the respiratory failure, then it may be safer to resuscitate and stabilize the patient before attempting intubation. A judgment call is also needed to determine if the patient is safe for transfer to the ICU for intubation to be performed there or not. The situationally difficult airway refers to challenges such as staff being unfamiliar with changes to workflow due to the need for PAPR, for example, as well as strict infection control measures that may affect how the intubation process is performed. Staff may also be worried about transmission and being infected by the virus. The team leader, has, as well as the team members, have to be aware of such concerns and manage them appropriately. So once you've decided that the patient needs intubation and determine where you should perform the intubation, make sure you don appropriate PPE. The first big step is to prepare the patient well. Now this involves having adequate as well as patent intravenous access. Correct any hypovolemia because giving induction agents as well as the process of intubation can cause significant hypotension. Make sure the patient is well monitored with pulse oximetry, blood pressure monitoring and continuous cardiac monitoring. If the patient has an NG tube, then aspirate the NG tube first. And of course, remove dentures as well as any unnecessary items in the environment. Number two is preparing the equipment. This image displays the equipment that should be prepared or at least be readily available if needed. In suspected or confirmed COVID-19 cases, we prefer to use the video laryngoscope, especially if a PAPR is being used by the healthcare worker. It is reasonable to leave some of these items, such as the extra blades, outside the room as long as they are readily available. Other items such as the laryngeal mass airway, hyperangulated blades, and equipment needed for front of neck access is not shown here, but the team should ideally have these equipment readily available should they be needed. These equipment are carried by the airway team in our institution, and the airway team should be informed if a difficult airway is anticipated. So we go through the equipment we have prepared. Firstly is the ETT. Make sure that the stylet is well fitted and also that the stylet and ETT has been lubricated. Also make sure that the cuff of the ETT tube is working. We usually prepare another size for the ETT tube as well. Next is the oral airway. So here is the size 3 and size 4 oral airways. And very important is suctioning equipment. Here we are showing the Yanker suction. Our next is the surgical tape to help to secure the ETT after it has been inserted. 
and here is the bike block to protect the ETT. We also have the colorimetric device to help to detect CO2 and confirm position of the ET tube. Here is the mechanical filter and also the peep valve. By rotating the top of the peep valve, you can adjust the peep value. And here we have the McGrath video laryngoscope. We are now inserting the blade and turning on the device, making sure that it's working well before turning it off. Here is the direct laryngoscope and similarly you have to make sure that it's working well and there's battery and light working. Here is the clamp which we use in COVID-19 patients to minimize aerosolization of droplets and here is an HME or heat and moisture exchanger. We also prefer to bring in a bougie Here we are setting up the back valve mask device. First is the mechanical filter that we are attaching, followed by the mask. Next is the peep valve. And when you attach the peep valve, make sure it's fitted securely, otherwise it may fall out quite easily. And don't forget the oxygen tubing as well. To minimize circuit disconnections, we can actually pre-attach the carbon dioxide detector to the back valve mask device. And once the ETT has been placed, this can be easily attached to the ETT. Here we're showing how to adjust the PEEP valve. Uh, by rotating the top of the PEEP valve, you can determine what level of PEEP you want to set. This picture illustrates the different blades that may be used for endotracheal intubation. We have the classic Macintosh blades that are seen attached to the direct laryngoscope as well as the McGrath video laryngoscope on the extreme left. On the extreme right is the Glidescope which uses a hyperangulated blade. For these blades, the laryngoscope should be introduced at the midline without displacement of the tongue. And also for the Glidescope, a rigid stylet is required during endotracheal intubation. Take note that the McGrath video laryngoscope can come together with a hyperangulated blade as well, otherwise known as the X blade. Similarly, for the Glide Scope video laryngoscope, there may be Macintosh stout blades that come together with the Glide Scope, and therefore it's important to know which blade you are using before performing endotracheal intubation. This next picture illustrates the rigid stylet that is used with the Glide Scope laryngoscope. Number three is to prepare medications. In the previous talk, we have went through the various medications that we use for endotracheal intubation. Here, we thought we'd show everyone how these medications look like when they come in the vials unprepared. The first one is uh, midazolam. Here, it comes in 5 mg and 5 ml. Notice that the dose that we give in critically ill patients who are hypotensive may be significantly lower than the dose we use in classical RSI. This is somewhat termed as modified RSI, in which we give titrated doses of sedative agents. A common dose that we sometimes give patients who we worry about hemodynamic instability is about 2 to 3 mg of midazolam. The next drug is propofol. Here it comes 200 mg in 20 ml. And again, propofol can cause hypotension, and therefore, in patients who are hypotensive, we do give titrated doses of propofol, for example, starting with a 30 to 50 mg dose of propofol. Fentanyl can be used as a co-induction agent, and it comes in 100 micrograms in 2 ml. The last one is ketamine, which comes in 100 mg in 2 ml. It can be useful for patients who are hypotensive, and it does have some bronchodilator properties as well. For paralytic agents, the most common agent that we use is succinylcholine, and this comes in 100 mg in 2 ml. Always remember that hyperkalemia is a contraindication for succinylcholine. An agent that we sometimes use is rocuronium, and this comes in 50 mg in 5 ml, as shown as the image on top and bottom. Take note that rocuronium needs to be refrigerated, and therefore is not commonly found in many of the general wards. Also, the duration of rocuronium lasts for about 45 to 60 minutes. And therefore, in a patient who you cannot intubate and cannot ventilate, you may need to give a reversal agent urgently. 
And this is Sugamadex, which comes in 200 milligrams in two meals. The dose of Sugamadex required for reversal is 16.16 milligrams per kg. And therefore, you may need to give up to four to five vials of this medication. For all endotracheal intubations, it is important to stand by IV fluids in case the patient turns hypotensive and always try to correct hypovolemia before the intubation if possible. Also, some medications can be very useful for patients who are hypotensive or hemodiably unstable, and these include adrenaline as well as phenylephrine. Now, take note that these medications can come in various concentrations and solutions. So, for example, looking at the extreme left of the image, we have adrenaline, which is available in a 1 mg per mL concentration in a 1 is to 1,000 solution. Now, to dilute this, you can take 1 mL of this adrenaline, which is 1 mg, and dilute it with saline to make up 10 mL of volume. And this will give you a concentration of 100 micrograms per mL. And therefore, every mL of this will be a dose of 100 micrograms adrenaline. You can also further dilute this by taking out 1 mL of this 100 micrograms per mL solution and again diluting it with saline to make up 10 mL of volume. And this will give you a final concentration of 10 micrograms per mL of adrenaline. Notice on the right hand side is also adrenaline, but now it is at a concentration of 1 mg per 10 mL or a 1 is to 10,000 solution. In this case, every mL of solution will contain 100 micrograms of adrenaline. However, these are only available in the emergency drug kits in our hospital. Phenylephrine comes in a 1 mg per 10 mL solution in our hospital and is illustrated in the image in the middle. And usually for IV push doses, we tend to give about 100 to 200 micrograms each time every 1 to 5 minutes. When you draw out and prepare your medications, make sure to label these medications very clearly with the concentration as well as the name of the medication for each syringe. And also when you label these medications, try to avoid covering the graduated markings on the syringe that tell you how many mils of medication is left. Number four is planning and team briefing. And it's a very important part of the intubation preparation. Make sure you assign roles clearly to all team members so that everyone knows exactly what his responsibility is during the intubation process. Also talk through the intubation plan so that all team members are aware of what is plan A, B and C and what to do when a difficult airway is encountered. And of course, uh, make sure that everyone dons appropriate PPE. Take this opportunity to recheck each other's personal protective equipment. This image shows a intubation checklist which is extremely useful to go through a final time before going into the room to intubate the patient. So number five is pre-oxygenation and it's especially important in critically ill patients who have severe pneumonia, ERDS and who are significantly hypoxemic. Now pre-oxygenation has to be well done. For example, a minimum of three to five minutes should be used for pre-oxygenation. Patients should be ideally elevated head up position and taking tidal volumes to maximize pre-oxygenation. And this is also important in the setting of COVID-19 patients because this will help to minimize the need for manual or mask ventilation during the intubation process, which will hopefully minimize aerosolization and transmission of the infection to healthcare workers. So here we show an illustration of how we pre-oxygenate our patients. So firstly, try to elevate the head of the bed if possible, ideally about 30 to 45 degrees. Secondly, it's also important to ensure that there's actually adequate flow that's being provided to the patient. In addition, we sometimes use a nasal cannula to provide an additional 4 to 5 liters through the nasal cannula. But the real purpose for the nasal cannula is during apneic oxygenation, during the process of intubation itself, to try to minimize the need for manual or mask ventilation. So on top of the nasal cannula will be the face mask or non rebreather mask in this illustration here. Now in addition, we can also use the back valve mask device attached to a filter and here again high flow of oxygen is provided with a good mask seal to reduce aerosolization.
So number six is positioning the patient for intubation. And this is an important part of the intubation process because a poorly positioned patient will make the intubation much more difficult. So to do that, we first lower the head of bed, shift the patient up, as well as elevate the height of the bed that is most comfortable for the procedurist. Also, we can put a pillow or a towel below the patient's head or shoulders. And what we are aiming to do is to elevate the triggers of the ear in line with the sternal notch. What this does is actually to facilitate flexion at the lower cervical spine. And in addition, if we do an extension maneuver at the atlanto occipital joint, what this aims to achieve is alignment of the laryngeal, pharyngeal and oral axis to facilitate direct visualization of the focal cords for intubation. When you are ready to intubate, the induction agent can be administered. This can be given in titrated doses for a modified rapid sequence intubation technique. It is important during this time for two-way communication that, so that every team member knows exactly what dose and time the medication was given. Another team member should monitor vital signs and inform the team if there are any significant changes. If the patient adequately sedated, paralytic agent is then administered. If a nasal prong is used for apneic oxygenation, ensure that the flow of 15 liters per minute is provided. Avoid manual ventilations if possible. If these are required, provide gentle back mask ventilations with a good mask seal. Once the patient is adequately paralyzed, proceed by gently introducing the blade of the laryngoscope and maintaining sight of the blade while it is introduced. This is to avoid trauma to the teeth and oropharyngeal structures. Then switch your view to the video screen and gently introduce the ETT while keeping the tip of the blade at the vernacular. The ETT is introduced past the vocal cords and the stylet removed. The back valve mask is then quickly connected to the ETT. Ensure that the cuff is inflated before manual ventilation is commenced to reduce dispersion of respiratory droplets. Check for color change of the carbon dioxide detector, chest rise and misting in the endotracheal tube to confirm placement. Five point auscultation, while commonly performed, may not be feasible with the use of PAPR and may be omitted in that situation. Now it is important to take some moments to describe how to safely maneuver the laryngoscope blade. Firstly, during intubation, do not rotate the laryngoscope as this will damage the upper teeth and mucosa of the patient. Instead, with the tip of the blade at the vernacular or the base of the epiglottis, lift the laryngoscope up and away from the patient's head as directed by the white arrow in this figure. This will help to optimize direct visualization of the vocal cords when using a direct laryngoscope. A common mistake is also to insert the blade too deep, and this will make it impossible for the procedurists to identify the vocal cords or the epiglottis if the blade is not redrawn. Instead, the appropriate technique is to progressively advance the blade and identify landmarks along the way, such as the uvula, the epiglottis, and the vocal cords. Here we are demonstrating intubation with the glide scope and use of a rigid stylet. Notice that the stylet will need to be redrawn first before the rest of the endotracheal tube can be advanced past the vocal cords. This is also illustrated in this video here. The video laryngoscope is being introduced into the oropharyngeal space and the vocal cords are visualized with the tip of the blade at the molecular. The endotracheal tube is introduced and once it is beyond the vocal cords, Notice that the endotracheal tube cannot be advanced further. The rigid stylet is now being removed and then the endotracheal tube can slide in smoothly until the horizontal line of the endotracheal tube is approximately at the level of the vocal cords. A CO2 detector can help to confirm placement of the endotracheal tube by a change in color from purple to yellow, indicating that exhaled carbon dioxide is being detected. Notice that the filter continues to be used here and it is important in patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. Here we are illustrating a scenario where the team encounters difficulty with intubation. One example can be secretions of blood in the pharyngeal space which can obstruct view of the vocal cords. And this emphasizes the need to have suctioning equipment readily available.
Occasionally, visualization of the vocal cords may be difficult with a direct laryngoscope, less likely so with a video laryngoscope. Nevertheless, external laryngeal manipulation can be applied by displacing the thyroid cartilage in the backward, upward, and rightward direction to improve your view. A bougie can also be useful. Introduce the bougie past the vocal cords like you would with an ETT, and while keeping the laryngoscope in place, railroad the inner tracheal tube over the bougie and past the vocal cords. Occasionally, the bevel of the endotracheal tube may get caught at the vocal cords and resistance is encountered. A slight anticlockwise rotation of the endotracheal tube usually allows the tube to slip past the vocal cords. In the attempt that the team is unable to intubate, a second attempt can be made, but make sure to change something either a more experienced procedurist, a different laryngoscope with a hyperangulated blade, or repositioning the patient. Do not attempt more than twice. When intubation is not successful, the next step is to provide adequate ventilation while awaiting for help. In a patient with suspected or confirmed COVID-19, insertion of a laryngeal mask airway is preferred. If you're not familiar with insertion of a laryngeal mask airway, then back mask ventilation can be provided with the use of an oral airway Keep a good mask seal during ventilations and activate the airway team for help. If you are unable to intubate the patient, effective back mask ventilations may be life saving. Patency of the upper airway can be achieved by using three fingers to lift the jaw, forming an E, and the thumb and index finger holding the mask to the face, forming a C, to maintain a good mask seal. To secure the endotracheal tube, a holder or tape can be used. Here we illustrate the use of surgical tape to secure the tube. Firstly, prepare two unopened 20 ml syringes, then secure the surgical tape over both sides of each syringe, while providing some allowance for the patient's neck. Prepare a length of tape to stick over the center portion to create a non-adhesive portion for the back of the neck. First, remove the nasal prongs without disconnecting the back valve mask. We proceed with securing the endotracheal tube by sliding the prepared syringes with surgical tape under the neck of the patient. Starting from the right side of the patient as seen in this illustration, split the tape into two and using the top half of the, of the tape going over the ETT as such to secure both the endotracheal tube and bite block. Note at this time that a gauze is placed between the bite block and the corner of the lips to prevent pressure injury and the bite block is also secured with a transparent dressing. The bottom half of the tape is then crossed over and placed over the upper lip. We now proceed from the left side of the patient, again splitting the tape into half. Using the bottom half of the tape going under the endotracheal tube to secure again both the endotracheal tube and bite block. The edges of the tape are folded to facilitate removal when necessary. Notice that the syringe can be helpful in this case to secure the tape for later use. We have now removed the syringe and the other half of the tape is then secured over the upper lip. During the entire intubation procedure, it is crucial to maintain the endotracheal tube in place. Immediately after intubation, the depth of the endotracheal tube should be noted. Generally, the endotracheal tube depth is usually 19 to 22 centimeters in most adult patients. Before connecting the ventilator, clamping the endotracheal tube with gauze helps to minimize dispersion of respiratory droplets and aerosols. This is recommended for patients with COVID-19. Notice that the inline suction and HME or ETCO2 adapter if used are already pre-attached to the breathing circuit. Finally, it is important to monitor for complications post-intubation. Sedatives positive intrathoracic pressure resulting in reduced venous return, air trapping, or pneumothorax can all result in hypotension. 
Also, when faced with persistent hypoxemia, immediately post intubation, always think about the possibility of an esophageal intubation. End tidal carbon dioxide capnography, if available, can help confirm placement of the endotracheal tube with normal ET CO2 waveform seen for at least 3 to 6 breaths. Other causes of hypoxemia post intubation include a dislodged endotracheal tube or leak, as well as secretions blocking up the endotracheal tube. Lastly, be careful about patients with significant acidemia. It is important to set appropriate ventilator settings initially to maintain a high minute ventilation for these patients. Thank you for listening to our talk and we hope that it has been useful.